walk into your house and to lift our hands and to worship you, God. Lord, it's so awesome to feel your presence here right now, God. Lord, we want you to move into this place, Lord. Move into this place tonight, God. Lord, reign all the great victory here tonight. Scott Wells, everybody remember Scott Wells, amen, uh, the truck driver that comes here when he can, amen, uh, he is in the hospital in California with COVID and need the touch from God, amen, brother Hale is still in the hospital here, uh, still suffering from COVID, my wife's brother's family has continued to pray for them, amen, that's God would undertake, amen. Uh, he's, he's just basically sleeping most of the time now. He's, of course, we're trying to keep him from feeling as much pain as possible with this particular type of cancer he's got. But we want to pray for the family, amen. Yes. Amen. This is tough stuff to go through. I've been there, done that, amen. And he's an, oh, Jason, his son, is an only child, just like I was, so I can relate, amen. And I, we just want God to touch that family and wrap his arms around them. Amen. Good people. Amen. Good people. They just need the comfort of the Lord right now. So let's just pray for that. Any other requests of prayer? Amen. Sister. All right. And also pray for Sister Elizabeth. She's sick tonight. Still. And I continue to pray for her family. Amen. Any other sister? Brindley. The jail. The jail service. Tomorrow night. Amen. That's why we're having church tonight, because tomorrow night the ladies will be in jail. <laughs> Amen. So we had to do it while they were all able to come here. Hallelujah. But they'll let them out, I promise you. Yes. Yeah. Amen. These women's too wild for that jail. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So we want to pray. Amen. For the jail service that God will bless it. Amen. That somebody will get the Holy Ghost there. Amen. 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 If we don't do nothing but pray our own ladies do, that's a good start. Amen? Amen. Uh, Boy, quiet on that one, didn't it? <laughs> I'm just sticking my foot all up in my mouth tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. God, we thank you for loving us. God, I thank you for your mercy and your goodness to us tonight, God. And I'm asking you right now, Lord, you would extend your mercy, God. I'm asking you to touch Scott Wales, Lord. I'm Lord, extend your mercy to him, God. I'm asking you, God, to dispatch angels to that hospital in California, God. Uh, touch his body and raise him up from that bed of affliction, Lord. Uh, God, bring him back home where he belongs, God. Uh, Lord, I'm asking you right now that you would move, God, that you would touch, uh, Lord, every need. God, you see those needs, Lord, of Sister West, God, and her family, God. Uh, Lord, we believe in you tonight, God, that you're going to touch them, Lord. I believe in you, God. Uh, Lord, that you're going to move, God, on my wife's uh, brother's family, God. Uh, Lord, that you're going to wrap your arms around his wife and Jason, Lord, and, and his wife, God. I'm asking you and those granddaughters that you would just love them all, God. Uh, Lord, let them know, God, that you're there for them, God, and you're going to be beside them, Lord. Uh, God, I'm trusting you tonight, God, to do a great and a mighty work with them, Lord. Uh, God, we ask you to move right now, Lord God, upon this service tonight. Let there be an anointing and a power from on high in this house tonight. God, we give you glory and honor and praise. Hallelujah. Let's thank you for answering us right now, my God. We give you glory. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, O oh God. Touch from the hail, Lord. God, we give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to praise the Lord in song tonight. Amen. We're not going to keep you real long. We've got to get into lesson six as quick as we can. Hallelujah. Let's just 
worship the Lord tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lord. Amen. Bring our offerings unto the Lord. Hallelujah. My brother. And where's brother Bob? We're out by. He's working now. Come on, please. Well, you, you can grab one on the left rock, Rob. Coaching. Amen. All right. Pass them out. Their names are on the back. Your brother Williams the one, one of them that says guest on it. Okay. Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to be continuing on with our series, The Way of an Eagle, tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give God glory tonight. Let's thank Him right now. God, we love you. Lord, we worship you, O oh God. We praise you, O oh Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. My Lord, I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise, Lord. I thank you, O oh God. Amen. You can be seated. Now, you're going to not have some of the stuff in yours that I've got in mind. Amen, because the Lord began to add a few more things to mine after I got these printed. <laughs> Amen. Chick-fil-A gave me inspiration again. Amen. Hallelujah. So when you get it, turn to lesson six. Amen. Look around and see who's missing tonight. And why don't you give them a call and say, hey, we missed you in church. Amen. All right. The Way of an Eagle. Lesson six. We're going to be teaching tonight on spiritual direction. Spiritual direction. When you got your notebook and you got to open to page six, say amen. Miss Laura's not got hers yet, guys. Here's just back there. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> you had your last lesson and didn't even put the lesson in there, so I'll put it in for you today. Amen. All right. So the way of an eagle, lesson six. Spiritual direction. It will be the last lesson in this book until next week. Amen. There's several more lessons we're going to begin. Uh, this spiritual direction is carrying us to a place, amen, that will lead us into uh, some great things that this church needs. Amen? amen? Hallelujah. So we're teaching spiritual direction. The eagle has nine feathers on each wing tip, five tail feathers, which play a major role in the power and stability of the eagle in flight. Air passes, and this is where they got the idea to use this for airplanes, I guess. Air passes more quickly over the top of the wings than under the bottom, thus creating lift. You ever been on an airplane? Anybody ever been flu? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you ever watched the airplane as he's taxiing down the runway to take off? If you watch that wing, you'll see that wing, their stuff starts sliding out of the back of the wing. Uh -huh. It makes that wing wider. What's that for? That's to give it lift. Hallelujah. Because you got a bunch of heavy folks on that plane and all their garbage under the bottom of that plane. And it's going to take a lot of lift to get that little critter off of there. Hallelujah. I was laughing here a while back. I was talking to somebody. It wasn't funny after I got to thinking about it that worked on airplanes. And they said, you wouldn't believe it. Said so first time I saw one of them wings come off of one of them jumbo jets when we were fixing it, there were only two boats holding that thing on that plane. Oh my. I was like, two boats? Really? <laughs> Made me think twice. But then my pastor back in uh, Dangerfield, Brother Watkins, used to always say, every time he got on a plane, the only thing he could think about was that thing was built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> so anyway, that didn't cost you nothing. Eagle has nine feathers on each wing tip and five feathers which play five tail feathers, which play a major role in the power and stability of the eagle in flight. Now, this is what the church needs. We need two things, stability and we need power. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible gives you the option, you shall receive power after 
the Holy Ghost has come upon you. How many of us in here has got the Holy Ghost? Amen. 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 Then you have the ability to tap into the power that's there. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. So we need the power and we need the stability. Amen. So air passes more quickly over the top of the wings than under the bottom. That's the where they got this to fly airplanes with. Thus creating lift. The difference between these two air speeds causes a whirlwind of air to form near the wingtips. And this creates what is known as drag. If you've ever been around an airplane much, if you've been working in the Air Force Base like some of us have for the Wiley, then you probably know what drag is. Amen. That would normally slow the wing, the eagle down. But because of its nine wingtip feathers, nine small whirlwinds are formed instead of just one large one. As they expand, now he can spread those wingtip feathers out, the spinning currents collide and cancel the drag effect, thus enabling the eagle to fly almost indefinitely. These nine feathers on each wing that provide a balanced, powerful flight can be likened to the nine gifts of the Spirit and the nine fruits of the Spirit. And we're going to tap into that starting next week. The five tail feathers which aid in direction and control of its flight can be likened to the five-fold ministry. Yeah. Amen. And you hear that. The, the tail feathers, he's got five major tail feathers. That's not the only tail feathers he's got, but he's got five major ones which aid him. You ever watch a bird fly? I, I always thought that was the most interesting thing. You watch, especially you get the big old ugly black birds around here, you know. If you didn't if you didn't know they were here park under a tree for a while, you'll figure it out. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's either it's either big birds or there's some small rodents in the tree. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, your your car will be covered, I promise you, and it ain't with feathers. But if you ever watch them fly, I, I like to sit and watch them in my backyard sometimes. They'll come flying in, fixing a crash into my wife's chicken pen to get some food, you know. She'll go feed the chickens and all the birds in the area. And they come flying over the fence and they'll twist that little tail. If you watch, they'll twist that little tail. You know why? That turns the bird. And in his wings, his wings what holds him in the air. It's that tail that turns him. And it turns, with their way up, well, that tail turns, he goes the other way. It's just like, kind of like a boat motor or something. Anyway, so they, the tail feathers aid in direction and control of its flight. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 said, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, I want to read that in the original Greek. In the original Greek, the scripture reads like this. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some shepherds and teachers with a view to the perfecting of the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. Each of these offices has a certain view it alone can operate in. That's why we have a lot of instant preachers through here. That's why when we get them, we get prophets through here. You know why? Because you have to hear from the fivefold ministry. It's not all about the pastor in the pulpit. I know pastors that don't ever have preachers in their, in their pulpits. You know what happens? That church eventually begins to just go down the same little path and it starts going lower and lower and lower because you don't have the, the lift that you need. Amen? Right. And so you've got some that are apostles. You've got some that are prophets. Now, each of these folks, the offices has a certain view that it alone can operate in. And we're going to go through each of these offices real quick to kind of give you an idea. According to Strong's Greek Dictionary, an apostle is an ambassador of the gospel commission of Christ with miraculous powers. A prophet is one who has insight into divine things and speaks them forth to others, one who shows or confirms one heart. An evangelist is a preacher of the gospel. A pastor is an overseer. And a teacher is an instructor. Now, if you read that scripture right, when it when it talks about 
he gives some shepherds and teachers with a view to the perfecting of the saints. Now, it kind of blends those two together. A pastor is also a teacher. Amen. All of these offices are to help in the perfecting of the saints for the work of service for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, Ephesians 2 chapter verse 19 through 21. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And you probably don't have so many scriptures in yours because, like I said, uh, Chick-fil-A messed me up and I had to come back and get more scriptures. Amen. And you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. All right, so we, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the chief cornerstone, but the foundation laid is laid with the apostles and the prophets. Hallelujah. Amen. And in fact, if you go back when you begin to research, if you if you study the Bible very much and you begin to research what we what we believe and what we understand is truth in the Bible, you'll see it goes way back into the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. Many prophets stood and gave prophecies that they never saw fulfilled in their lifetime. And in fact, it wasn't fulfilled for many generations after them. Right. Amen. Right. David in the Psalms. You, you know, we always look at Psalms and we think, well, that's a great book of, of a nice poetry that we can preach from every now and then and make people feel good. I'm sorry, it ain't all feel good in there. But there is a lot of prophecy in there. Yes, sir. Right. It's full of prophecy concerning Jesus. Amen. Isaiah concern, has a lot of prophecy concerning Jesus. And if you want some good one God messages, go to Isaiah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. He don't mess around. Amen. He, he lets us know there is but one God. Hallelujah. All right. So when we think about an apostle, our mind goes at once to those that we were the 12 called by Jesus. Amen. And many people, when you say the word apostle, that's all they think about is those 12. Uh -huh. You know, and that's not even enough in the Bible. I mean, there was a lot more mentioned in the Bible than that. And I've given you scripture. I'm not going to read all these scriptures tonight concerning each one. Paul was considered an apostle. And in fact, if you go back and read the book of Acts, you will see that the apostles that were apostles called by Jesus actually accepted him as an apostle. Right. Hallelujah. Alright, so Galatians 1 and 1, look what Paul said. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ. Look at Barnabas. Barnabas was considered an apostle. That's one of the guys that hung around with Paul. Acts 14, 14. Which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran out in among the people crying out. Now, Here's a list. I didn't, I didn't look up all these scriptures for you. I just wrote them down. Adronicus, Romans 7, 16 and 7. Junius, Romans 16 and 7. James, the Lord's brother, in Galatians 1 19. Silvanus, in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1 and 2 and 6. Timothy, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 1 and 2 and 6. Epaphroditus, Philippians 2 and 25. The word apostolos does not appear in most English translations, but does appear in the Greek on this particular scripture. Strong's word 652, Apostolos. Ap Apollos. Remember Apollos was at Corinth? Amen. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 6 through 9, and 1 Corinthians 3 and 22. All of these men were considered apostles in the Word of God. Right. One trait of an apostle is a church plan. Right. Hallelujah. So, <laughs> what did the 12 do? Remember on the day of Pentecost. Well, let's back up. Acts chapter 1. Luke said the former treatise, O Theophilus, have I given you of all that Jesus both did and taught until the day that he was received up. And then you read on down from that point forward and you see that he spent 40 days with those 12 apostles after he came out of the tomb. Right. Before he was taken up. And, and, and he commanded them all that they were both to do and to teach. Hallelujah. You know what he was depending on? He was depending on those guys to establish the church that he was getting. Amen. They were the founding fathers of the church. Hallelujah. Now, let me, I'm fixing to 
break somebody's theology here, but do you know that the first popes in the Roman Catholic Church were Jesus' name baptized folks? Do you know they got called on the carpet and killed because of that? Because the Roman Catholic Church was established was definitely not Jesus' name. Amen. In fact, they didn't know what they were and they still don't know what they are. Amen. All they know is that they got all these money, all this money and all these statues and all this stuff they worship. Amen. But, but can I tell you, it, it, it was really crazy because here you've got... Uh, You've got the, the Roman Catholic Church being established and, and it, it's beginning to be built up. And uh, Constantine, the emperor, who was not a Christian, everybody thinks Constantine was this big, powerful Christian man. He was not a Christian in any way, shape, or form. He was a Roman emperor. His move of creating the Catholic Church was simply to pull all the religions in to him. Because he got the bigger and out. He was kind of like, uh, wasn't that Khrushchev that said, religion is the opiate of the people? I believe that's who it was. And, and, and Constantine was a lot of that same thinking. He thought, well, you know what? If people like religion so much, why don't we just pull them all together and make one big one? And that's how they started that thing. I don't know why I'm off on that, but that's all right, too. And, and that's how it got its start. That's how it got kicked off. Amen. But you need to understand today, amen, that God has established his church. Hallelujah. And he did it with the apostles, the first 12. Amen. There were more that I just read to you that joined later. Amen. They, they all became apostles later on. Paul became an apostle Amen. Jesus himself, amen, struck him down on the road to Damascus. And, and Jesus himself spoke to him. Hallelujah. Amen. He, he, he told him, he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard. You're not persecuting the church. You're persecuting me. Hallelujah. And it's hard for you to kick against the bricks. And so, you know what the pricks was? That was an ox goat. That was a, a sharp pointed stick that they used when they were driving oxen and they had the oxen in a yoke together, especially younger oxen. They, they would kick back into traces and when they would, amen, they, they would talk to turn over the cart or whatever they were pulling. And, and so they, they would keep a sharp pointed stick and, and, and if one of the oxen got to kicking back, they would just put that little stick down there close to his heels and he kicked back into that a couple of times. He decided that wasn't a good idea. And, and so Paul, Jesus is talking to him from the heavens. Now, you got to understand, Paul is a very religious person. He was, I'm talking about he was top shelf, good old boy religion. Amen. And he thought he was doing God a service. And seriously, he really did. He thought he was doing God a service by getting rid of all these Yahoos who believed that Jesus was God. Until he had his own encounter. Hallelujah. He had a close encounter of the Jesus kind. Amen. Hallelujah. You can imagine all of a sudden you're right walking down the road, minding your own business, you're going to do the will of God. You know, all of a sudden this blinding light hits you and knocks you off your feet and you can't see nothing. You're instantly blinded. Amen. And, and, and you're laying there on the ground and all of a sudden the voice says, calls you by name. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. Somebody up there knows me. It's hard for you to kick against the brakes. Stop what you're doing. I'm about to send you to a street called straight. Hallelujah. Woo. <laughs> Amen. You're going to straighten up on straight. Street. Amen. And, and so he goes into town. Of course, you know the rest of the story. Amen. And then he started writing the New Testament. Hallelujah. All right. So was he an apostle? Yes, he was considered an apostle. I just read it to you. All these others that I read you their names, they were all considered apostles. Amen. In the word of God. One trait of an apostle is that he is a church planner. Are there still apostles today? Yes. Amen. 
Now, sometimes we may call them missionaries. They may be missionaries. Amen? Sometimes we may call them home missionaries because they established churches in America or in their native country, wherever they live. Amen? But we understand that that is part of the office of an apostle. If you, if you look at, at, the, at the New Testament, you see how many churches, amen, that Paul was a part of establishing he didn't just sit back and write letters to churches. He didn't just do that. No, no, no. Those churches, he had personal, he had his hands in those churches, in their creation, in their living for God, in their working for God. Amen. He was a big part of all those churches. Amen. So, so we need to understand. Amen. In modern times, there's been those that have been considered apostles by their brethren. Those men established many churches, and some continued right up to the Lord, took them home. One example we know of right here would be Brother Keith Clark. You could call him an apostle. Amen. You know what? He established churches. Uh, he established one in Austin, Texas. Amen. He established one in Denver, Colorado. He established one in Las Vegas, Nevada. He didn't pastor them for years. He just got them going, and when he felt like God had a, he had them going good enough. And, and God would bring in a younger man that he could put into that place. Amen. Right. And, and those churches are all still in operation. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and he went back as an evangelist and preached in those churches. Yeah. Amen. Right. Uh, but, but you understand that that is the work of an apostle. All right. All right. So there are still prophets among us. The answer is a resounding yes. In biblical times, a prophet was a necessity as the only access people had to God was through a priest. Amen. Remember, they're out there in the wilderness. Uh, they just left Egypt land. They're wandering around out there. And God said, you know what? I'm going to give you uh, some priests. We're going to make some of these guys into priests. And the Levites were born. And, uh, you know, they became the priesthood of the of the Israelites. And they, they had the tent that, that they built that... God instructed Moses to build, and, and it was a beautiful thing out there in the middle of the wilderness, but God dwelt between the cherubims in the holiest of holies, and, and those priests would do all the service of the Lord. But man could never come in contact with God. You had to go through the priest. You brought your sacrifice to the priest. He sacrificed that lamb. He sacrificed that dove. He sacrificed that, that oxen or whatever it was for you. And then he took the blood and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat once a year to forgive all the sins of Israel and roll them ahead for a year. You, you understand there was a process, but man still did not have God at his fingertips. That's right. Amen. Now, all right. The prophets worked differently from the priests. And in fact, they were used of God to call out false prophets and false priests. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. More than one time, an old prophet of God walked in at the end of the road for some of them folks. Amen. Now, it was they who could walk up in the king's palaces unannounced, proclaiming judgment on the kingdom if they did not repent. More than one time in the Old Testament, prophets pronounced judgment then walked out of the king's presence to watch his kingdom crumble. Right, brother. Amen. More than one time. First Kings chapter 17. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Right. Wow. Can you believe that? Can you believe that God would actually use a man and that man would walk into the king's palace, point his bony finger at the king's nose and say, I'm fixing to say the word and it's fixing to not rain for several years. Till I say it rains again, it won't drop none. Then was he, oh, let me ask you this. Was he uh, a part of that? Yeah. Amen. God carried him out to a, a little brook called the Brook Cherith. Amen. And God sent ravens every day. I just imagine, I, you know, I, this is my imagination, but I can use it some. You know, I always imagine, you know, you're the king's palace and he had this 
this great kitchen and staff, you know, and man, they're baking cookies and pies and, and man, they're making big old roast and all this stuff. And, and I can see them setting that, that pie up on the window there, the window seal there to cool. Or maybe they got a, a brand new cake out of the oven that's set up on that window seal. And all of a sudden this crow comes by. <laughs> That old gal walks in there to give that cake. She said, where's that cake at? I know I just set it right here to cool. And Elijah's sitting over there, just leaning back against a rock, taking a nap. And all of a sudden he hears that croak. <laughs> and he looks up just in time to see a cake coming at him. Whoa. <laughs> Amen. You like cake? Here's you some cake. God. God knows what we like, don't you? Maybe now I'm just using my brain. I'm just using my imagination. I'm a wild child, okay? But but we do understand that God continued to feed him through that famine. There were people that were starving to death in that famine. But the man of God that had said it won't rain, his brook's drying up. Hallelujah. But God's always on time. And so God sends a little, a little angel down there and, you know, he does his thing and he, he feeds him a little angel food and he said, go on. He goes on the strength of that food for 40 days. Hallelujah. I want you to understand God takes care of his own. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, all right, so in chapter 18, Elijah calls out all the prophets of Baal in the land to a challenge as to who the one true God was. He stood alone facing 450 prophets of Baal. Now, that's why we always say that story. But he also faced 400 prophets of the groves. Read it. It's there. He actually made fun of them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love that part. That's, that's always my favorite part of that story. Old, old, old Elijah's all propped back up there. You know, he's waiting on them. Waiting on them. He's, going, he's giving them their time. Until it gets time for the evening sacrifice, he's okay, guys, y'all are done. Y'all yeah. <laughs> had three quarters of the day, and ain't no God answered y'all yet. <laughs> maybe he's in Hawaii on a Hawaiian vacation. Maybe, maybe just maybe. <laughs> or maybe he didn't get y'all's phone call. Y'all got your cell phones on you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe he's taking a nap. <laughs> I can just hear him cackle. <laughs> Maybe he's taking a nap. <laughs> then I know Elijah had to be a redneck. Because he builds this altar. He sacri puts the sacrifice, puts the wood on, puts the sacrifice on it. Then he said, okay, boys, bring the water on. And uh, bring me two more pickup loads. They bring you three or more pickup loads. Man, he's got it. He done dug him a ditch all the way around that thing. He, he, man, you talk about a showboat. He is being, yeah, he, he pours all that water on there. It fills the ditch up. It, I mean, that, oh, the, the wood is completely wet. The sacrifice is completely wet. Even if he had had matches, he couldn't have got it to burn. But I still believe that Elijah's a redneck. Because the next thing I imagine he said was, hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> Woo! And then he prayed that little prayer. And he said, y'all might want to stand back. Y'all don't want to get your beard singed. <laughs> and he backed them up and he prayed that little prayer. And all of a sudden, whoo! <laughs> don't you know they're surprised? You know what? God has always had men of God that know how to touch God. Right. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Now, after God proved himself to them, many of those who were straddling the fence joined in with Elijah to completely annihilate those false prophets. What about that prophet Nathan? Remember Nathan? Oh, yeah. Man, David, I ain't going to read all that scripture. We know the story. David lusts after a woman by the name of Bathsheba, and, and, and then he gets her husband killed because she, he finds out that she's pregnant with his kid. So... You know, it's, it's not a good story uh, line for David. And, and then all of a sudden, in walks prophet Nathan. Uh -huh. And he said, <clears throat> hey, David, I want to tell you a story. 
He goes, okay. He said, there were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought or bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. You gotta understand, David. This was, this guy loved that little sheep. And there came a traveler unto that rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was kindled greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Yeah. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. David was not ready for the next verse. Nathan said to David, and I can see that old bony Nathan finger pointing at his nose. Thou art the man. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed the king of Israel, and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom. Gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with a sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Amen. The Lord goes ahead and said, You're going to raise up Israel, evil against him. I'm going to take your wives from you. Amen. For thou didst it secretly, but I'll do it before all Israel, before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, that thou shalt die not. How be it? Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Nathan departed into his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And if you read the rest of those scriptures, you understand, amen, that God don't lie. <laughs> the Bible says that the child died. Amen. Just as the prophet Nathan had declared to David, so it happened. Amen. What about Samuel? As he asked Saul in 1 Samuel 15, 13 through 23, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment. Don't you love it when... Oh my God. When church folks lie. <laughs> Don't you love that? Let me be standing here talking to the prophet. Oh Lord, have mercy. He's talking to the prophet and he's lying through his teeth. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What mean of then this blading of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? I hear some sheep and I hear some oxen. And you didn't have them before that battle. Not that many. This ain't your sheep and this ain't your oxen. Mm, hallelujah. Saul so said they have brought them. Look at what, what he did. He blamed it on the church congregation. They have brought them from the Amalekites. What kind of a weak, limp-wristed king are you anyhow? I can tell you what kind of limp-wristed king he was. He was king enough, and he was head and shoulders above everybody, the Bible said. But he was king enough and brave enough that he let a little ruddy little kid, teenager, go out and kill a giant that he was afraid of. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah, that's the kind of king he was. Amen. But you got to understand, Samuel did not play with Saul. He said, you know what I told you, God. First of all, he messed around. He Remember, uh, Samuel said, I'll be there. I'm coming. Just hang tight. I'm coming. And, and he got a little bit antsy. And what did he do? He made the sacrifices himself that yeah. Samuel was supposed to have made. Uh -huh. He tried. He said, well, that preacher's late. 
I don't want to lie, pictures of being late. Well, I ain't never thought about it. He might have had a hospital visit or something. Yeah. You never know. Amen. You never know. He had something going on, or he wouldn't have been late. Yeah. Maybe God just made him late to see what Saul would react, how Saul would react. Amen. But we know how Saul reacted. He said, He's not here to do the sacrifice. I'll do it myself. There you are. Oh, Lord. Not a, not a good idea. Amen. To try to step into the minister's place in your life. And so he did that. Amen. So now he's in trouble with God because he's not done what God said. God said, I want you to totally annihilate. I do not want one Amalekite breathing on the earth when you get done. Right. <laughs> he brought the king back. Mm -hmm. He brought cows back. He brought sheep back. Now, normally that would have been all right, but God had told him, no, don't bring nothing back from that place. I want it all destroyed. Amen. Now, all right, but he blamed it on the people. You hear him? Here he is again. They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. Woo! Man, that ought to get old Samuel all fired up. It did. <laughs> but not in a good way. All right. So Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord had told me this night. And he said unto him, Oh, say on. Mm -hmm. He thought God was going to pat him on the back for bringing all these sheep and these oxen back to sacrifice them to the Lord. <laughs> you know, why did you do that when God said, Get rid of them? God doesn't, don't you understand? God does not want your sacrifices if it's in disobedience. If you're living in disobedience, God could care less about your sacrifices. In fact, your sacrifices are a stench in his nostrils if you're not obeying him. And that, look what he said. Let's skip on down. I'm not going to read all that. We know we know the story. But verse 21 said, but the people took of the spoil. That's what he's still in. He's still holding with that story. He must have worked for CNN on the side or something like that. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Wow. And to hearken than the fat of rams. To listen, no words. Saul, so you've got a hearing problem. And they don't even have hearing aids yet, so you're in trouble. Your, your problem is, you're so wrapped up in Saul, you can't hear the voice of God if he tries to speak to you, even through the man of God. Because you're so wrapped up in yourself. Amen. Uh, you remember what I was saying, a man wrapped up in themselves in a really small package. Amen. All right, so... Look what he goes on to say. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Don't be rebellious. God considers it as demonic as witchcraft. My God. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, fill in the office of the prophet, you know. You know, a lot of people hear, hear these guys that are prophets nowadays and, and, and you know, we're, we've got prophets in a non-profit generation. <laughs> anyway, that's all right. <laughs> and, and, and these guys come and they, they, they come into your church and you're expecting a man. They're going to bounce off the walls. They're going to tell us, you know, that God speaks to the blessed his church with a million dollars and, and 200 folks and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's what they're looking for. But if the man's a real man of God and he walks in there, the first thing he does is pick up Oh, my goodness, there's sin here. Uh, He's like a bloodhound. Uh, I used to watch my dad. My dad worked in the spirit all the time. He, he was a prophet of God. The whole time he was awake during the daytime, you, you could do good if you talked to him. You'd have to go out there and tap on his shoulder if you wanted to say something to him because he was in prayer most of the day. And if he walked into a, a church... If, you know, he could call some preachers and say, God gave me a word for you, and they'd hang up. Because they were afraid of what the word was going to be. Amen. There were a lot of churches that he didn't get invited to because 
they had things going on in their church they did not want revealed. You know? And, and that's what the prophet does. That's part of his work. Amen. So, if you want a ministry, don't pray to be a prophet. Amen. Amen. All right, now, an evangelist is a preacher of the gospel. Now, that's an exciting thing. The word evangelist is only used two other times in the Bible. Acts chapter 21, verse 7 and 8. And when he had finished our, we had finished our course from Tyre, we came to Ptolemais, saluted the brethren, and abode with them one day. And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. Remember Philip? The, remember the good story about Philip, the evangelist? Philip! Yeah, yeah, Lord. Go join yourself to that chariot. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I don't know how fast he had to run to catch up with it. Or if God just went, boop, boop, stuck him on board. Or maybe the guy was parked in a, in a no parking zone reading the scriptures. And, and, and he went over and got up in the chariot and said, Do you understand what you read? No, I can't. I can't understand except some man explained it to me. Well, that's what God just sent me here for. Let me explain this. And so he explained it to him. Gave, started at the scripture he was in. And I think he was in Isaiah, if I make no mistake. He read that scripture and he gave him the, the meaning of that scripture. And that he, he told him everything. And he was doing the work of an evangelist because he was an evangelist. He was evangelizing. Yes, Hallelujah. Amen. He, he's driving along in the chariot. And, and, and this Ethiopian eunuch looks and says, Hey, here's water right here. What's stopping me from being baptized right now? Oh, hallelujah. You know what? He didn't say, Well, I don't have a towel here. I have to go home and give me some clothes. But I want you to baptize me right, you know, when I get back. No. They went down into the water right then. Amen. And what happens? They come up out of the water. And guess what? The union turns around to say something and Philip's gone. He was translated. Boop. <laughs> He's gone. Amen. Because God needed him somewhere else. You know what? He's an evangelist. Amen. If more evangelists were closer to God today, we might see more of that translation stuff. You know? Because how many times does God need an evangelist in a certain area, but, but nobody wants to go because the portal of church can't afford an evangelist? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because it's become such a profession to a lot of people. Thank God we got some that it hasn't. But there are some of them that it is a profession now. And, and, and man, you know, they... I, I hated going to meetings. I always hated going to, to, to meetings, to preacher meetings and camp meetings and stuff because you'd leave with a handful of these really slick looking cards, you know, from all these evangelists. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, they say, hey, give me a call sometime. I said, do you know where I pastor at? No. Pastor in Wells, Texas. They look at me like, what in the world is Wells? I said, it's a spot in the road. You blink your eyes, you miss the red light. We don't even have a red light. Amen. That's why you missed it. We, Wells is on top of the hill. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a small town, 750 people. You don't want to, you know, probably, I'm, you know, evangelist, like you don't need to come there. You're, you're, you're a little more than I can afford, you know. And, and anyway, so, all right, so, well, let's go a little further. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, And I charge you therefore before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at, the appearing, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. He's telling, he's telling Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. People do not like that part. Preach me something that will make me feel good. If you are looking for a feel-good evangelist, it's probably because you are half backslid. Or maybe more. Amen. Because 
when that evangelist stands up and he begins to reprove and rebuke and exhort, uh -huh. <laughs> hallelujah, we don't like that sometimes because it gets down where we're living at. Amen. If that evangelist is following the Holy Ghost, it will provide, God will provide not only enough information to let people know God knows your sin, but many times he will actually show them who it is in the service and they will reach for them through the move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Been there, done that myself. I, I, had, I had a person call me, wanted me to come preach for him one time. And I went and preached and he, he said, I've got some issues in the church. I just need you to come and preach and see if the Lord will give you anything. God gave me a little sermon. I went with my little sermon, got to the pulpit. I read my scriptures, started off, and five minutes into the sermon, God took a right-hand turn. Yeah. But I didn't fall out of the saddle. I stayed in the saddle because I was expecting it. Amen. Yes. I, I was feeling after the Holy Ghost, and he took a turn, and I began to preach hard on witchcraft. Had nothing to do with the scriptures I had just read. Had nothing to do with the way I felt the sermon was going to go. But God was the one that knew which way it was going. And he turned it. And when he did, I'm telling you, this young lady jumps up and she screams. And she runs to the altar. Right there in the middle of the sermon. Totally messed up my good sermon. <laughs> but you know what was happening? She was a young minister's wife. And what was happening was God sent me there, amen, to pull that out. Now, what was I doing? I was rebuking. Yes, sir. I was reproving. Amen. I, God was showing me what was happening there. Right. Amen. I didn't know that. I had no idea that was even going on. I did not know the, the pastor just called me and said, hey, I need you to come preach. I've got some issues in the church. I want to see if God will show you. God showed me this. Let's listen to the sermon. God's already showed it. And this young lady is screaming, running through the altar. Come on, brother. Now she fell on the altar. They prayed with her and she repented. But the problem was she never let go of it. And so later on, she ended up going back into witchcraft with her mother and her family that she came out of. Divorced her husband, went back and is living in witchcraft today. Her husband's still in the church and still preaching the gospel. Come on, brother. You got to understand, God knows exactly what's going on. That's what the evangelist does. He follows that spirit. Amen. All right, now let's go further. So... Paul tells Timothy as an evangelist, he is to not only preach the word, but he's to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all them separate in doctrine. He said in verse 5, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're game for the ministry, you need to read the first part of that verse. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Amen. If you're going to be in the ministry, you will endure afflictions more than one time. Yes, Come on, brother. Amen. Yes. Brother Williams is backing me up back there because he's been in this a lot longer than I have. And I can promise you he's been through a lot of afflictions in his life. Absolutely. Amen. Now, uh, I'm taking my time on this because I want to get this, this out. Evangelist works like a prophet. Amen. The office of the pastor. Let me go there. Officer of the pastor or overseer of the church is quite complicated. It's, you know, I, I, I've had preachers, people tell me, not preachers, I've had people tell me, because most, most preachers know what, if they've ever been a pastor, any at all. Now, let me say this, okay? I'm, I'm going to say this, I'm going to just put this out there. There are some ministers who are some of the most powerful evangelists on earth. I promise you, I know several of them. But because of life, you know, they have kids and all this kind of stuff, they want to settle down. So they go take a pastorate. You are not a pastor. You're not called to be a pastor. You're called to be an evangelist. So what's wrong with that situation? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. If you deal with the stuff that a pastor deals with on a daily basis, amen, many times it's on a daily basis, you will not know how to deal with that if you've been an evangelist all your life. 
because it's a totally different ball game. As an evangelist, you can walk into a church not knowing anything, and you can get up and you can preach the Word of God, and, and you can follow the Holy Ghost, and you can pick up on things in the church, and you can address it, and then you're done, you walk out. And you don't see all the stuff going on behind the scenes. You don't see the people that are trying to undermine the pastor. But they're there. Amen. They were there. Hallelujah. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. They were there. Amen. You know what, Brother Williams? God knew they were there. I didn't. I really didn't have a clue. We were in the most powerful revival mode I've ever been in in any church. We were having miracles and signs and wonders nearly every service. In between services. I remember one night, one guy, they called me and said, Hey, we got a guy down here at the church we're praying for. He's been strung out on drugs and he wants deliverance. I went down there to the church and we started praying with him. And while we're praying, God said, Call in some angels. Woo, hallelujah. And I said, God sent some angels in here to help me. Fight these demonic spirits. He ain't letting them go. Three angels showed up. Three angels. Boom, boom, boom. I knew exactly when they came. And I counted them when they got there. Three of them. And just in a few minutes, that man released himself and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. After he got through, and we're all sitting around rejoicing, and we're just chatting after he got through getting the Holy Ghost, you know what he told me? He said, you know, I heard you say, you know, I heard you praying for God to send some angels. And he said, he sent three. <laughs> now, I didn't tell him that God sent three. He told me that God sent three. I already knew it. Amen. He said, you know why he sent three? He said, no, that was kind of unusual. He said, because I was hung up on three different types of drugs. He said, now I'm clean. Woo, hallelujah. Amen. you got to understand, God knows, God knows what he's doing. And if a pastor is in tune with the Holy Ghost, he don't know what he's doing. Amen. Now, let me say this. There have been times, and I don't know if you can feel this too. There's been times, man, I have prayed and prayed and prayed all week long. And God gave me a message, and I felt, man, this is it, brother. This is it. And I hit the pulpit, and I preached my guts out, literally. And guess what? I looked at the congregation and everybody's like, oh, I wish they were get through. You know, that kind of deal. <laughs> and, and, and so I'd walk out the door and I would get in my car and I would sit there. There's been times that when my wife and I used to ride together back to the house that I wouldn't even say anything going home. I'd just be quiet. And it would be because it was bothering me because I felt like I had the message and then I felt like I had failed and I had missed God. And then I get to the house and just be fixing to go to bed and the phone would ring. And it'd be some sister or some brother on the phone crying their eyes out and saying, you don't know how I needed that tonight. It was just exactly what I needed. And, and, and that's the way the office of a pastor works. We don't just come up here and preach three times a week and just come up here. And, you know, I don't make things up to preach. I don't get on the internet and, and I watch Mark Morgan and say, man, I'm going to preach that. That's a good message. Woo! Hallelujah! I do get on the internet and watch Mark Morgan sometimes, but I don't preach his sermons. Say, man, if I can't find something from God for this congregation, I don't even need to be behind this pulpit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, all right, so the pastor is quite complicated. It can be and sometimes is also the most frustrating of the callings. Amen. Evangelist gets in there and tears stuff up, walks out and grins, takes his paycheck and leaves. Hallelujah. Go to another church where I can mess up something else. He's not really messing up. He's really not. He's just following the will of God. He's exposing things in the spirit that need to be brought up. That's what he's doing. All right? And so when that, when that happens, amen, that pastor, if that pastor's in tune with the spirit that that evangelist is in tune with, he's going to go forward with what that evangelist is already dealing with, amen, because that's God revealing things, amen. 
and he's going to take that and he's going to go with it. Hallelujah. Amen. So it's, it's, it's really a glorious calling. Amen. It's joyous sometimes. When a pastor sees someone come into God's church and turn away from the world and begin to walk with God, it's a thrilling thing. I get excited about it. Amen. I get excited when new people walk in that door. Hallelujah. I got excited when Junior Hernandez and his family came in that door on a Sunday morning. I had got a call on Saturday. We want to come and get baptized in Jesus' name because he's revealed it to us. That's the truth. They're going to an Assembly of God church in, 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 in uh, Colorado City, and God shows them the truth. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He called me. I didn't call him. He called me. He saw our, our internet. He, he saw our, our location on the internet, and he called us. He said, I want what you got. I want Jesus' name baptism. I asked my pastor to do it, and he refused to do it. Will you do it? I said, yeah, that's the only way we baptize. Amen. Woo, hallelujah. Then he said, now make sure you say, in the name of Jesus Christ. I said, well, Christ is only a title, but we'll do that if that's what you want, simply because of the fact that's where they were baptized in Acts 2, 38. Baptized around in the name of Jesus Christ. So he thought Christ said to be there. I said, okay, that's fine. We'll do that. We did. Amen. But you know what? It thrills as a preacher when that happens. It thrills a pastor. It excites him. Amen. On the other hand, when he sees to his dismay someone who's starting to slip. Yeah. Jesus. I wish I could tell you that it's all joy and bouncing off the walls all the time for a man of God. Brother Williams, there's many nights that I've stayed awake pastoring the church because somebody wasn't there. They didn't call. They didn't write me. They didn't text me. I don't know where they're at, but they're missing in action. And I know the day we're living in, and I understand that Satan has enlarged itself in this day and hour. Amen. You know, you know what that means? That means the devil is twice as much at work as he's ever been. Amen. He understands that he has but a short time left. And so what's he do? He comes in. He's not interested in the people out there. They're already on his side. He's interested in the people that are coming in here. Amen. He's interested in the people that are coming to an old-fashioned altar, repenting and turning their lives around and walking to, with God. He's interested in destroying them. Amen. Come on. And that's when pastoring gets hard. Pastoring has to be a God call position. If it were not God calling the shots. No mortal man in his right mind will be able to handle the stress of watching a soul purposely ignore the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, knowing they were stealing their faith to hell fire. So what is he, exactly does the pastor do? Jeremiah 3.15, And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So God gives pastors to feed you. That's what this is all about right here. I'm teaching you the Word of God. I'm feeding you the Word of God. I, I, you, you've got to understand, I could do this a whole lot more eloquently, but I break it down where even the simplest person in this congregation can understand it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want everybody to have a complete understanding of the Word of God. Amen. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, love, I love teaching. I love Bible teaching. I love hearing teachers that... Are eloquent. I do. I, I, I know some really good Bible teachers that are very eloquent in their in their speaking. But you know what they do? Boop, right over the heads of a lot of folks. Uh, yeah. Because there's a lot of folks that don't think that eloquently. <laughs> Amen. So they miss it. Amen. And and when God began to use me in teaching years ago, He began to show me break it down for the simplest person in your congregation. I don't care if they're visiting. And they just don't have an IQ of but 30. Break it down where they can understand it. Amen. All right. So 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says this about a bishop, which is a pastor. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Got to be blameless. Amen. You got to live a good life. Live for God. Amen. Where nobody can point their finger at you. 
The husband of one wife. Raise your hand, Sister Driscoll. That's one. You're my first wife? Yes, ma'am. I got that. Hallelujah. <laughs> my only wife. Vigilant. You got to be vigilant. He's got to be sober. That don't mean he don't drink. Okay, I don't drink, but that's not what that's talking about. That means his mind, hitting his thinking. Of good behavior. I try my best. It's hard sometimes. <laughs> Given the hospitality. I'm just joking on that. <laughs> Given the hospitality, I'm always hospitable. In fact, y'all can all come over to my house tonight after church if you want to. But you have to ask my wife. She's not as given to hospitality tonight as I am. Amen. Apt to teach. Hallelujah. Do y'all like my teaching? Yes, sir. All right. So I must be doing a good job. Not given to wine. Never have drank that stuff. No striker. Ain't hit a person in a water. It's been a long time since I hit anybody. Except with the word of God. Not greedy or filthy lucre. Could care less. Amen. I've got everything I need. God's blessed us. Be patient or but patient. Now that's a tough one there. That's a tough one. But you know why? Because as a pastor, a lot, not all the time, thank God, amen. But every once in a while, there's one of those people who shows up in a congregation that tries that patience to the very end. Amen. Well, we've had a couple of them. We have over the years. I've been passionate over 20 years. And we've had a couple of those, haven't we, said Driscoll? Amen. Amen. That yeah, have tried my patience. Not a brawler. I don't get out and brawl with folks. And I'm not covetous. You know, you get a new boat, I'm just proud for you. Thank God you got a new boat. Now I'll find a lake to put it in. <laughs> all right. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection in all gravity. Andrew, are you in, are you in subjection? Verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. That means an amateur. Oh, Lord God forbid I'm an amateur after 20 years of this. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. This is the problem. A lot of men of God. Now, I, I, I mentioned this a while back in the message. that uh, it, it bothers me because a lot of young ministers are coming up that, that are used in the gifts, that are used in the prophetic ministry. Uh, and Brother Wheeler, you know this is a fact. You've seen this as well as I have. I've seen it happen to more than one young minister that was used mightily by the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, uh, they're pushed up to the very top. Preach that congregation. You preach that camp meeting. Right. Man, after about three or four camp meetings and they're getting that big money, I could call them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they would never pick up the phone and answer me because they have no clue where Abilene, Texas is. You know? And so what happens is they get all wrapped up in their self. I said it a while ago, a man wrapped up in his own self is a very small package. They get all wrapped up in their selves, and what happens is they fall. Yes, they do, brother. And so they have to go and start preaching to charismatic congregations so they can make some dollar bills because that's the way they only, only way they know how to make money. They've never really had to work because they were pushed to the top as young ministry. And now they're ruined for life. They'll never be what God needed them to be. And I'm talking about some powerful men of God. I have a lot of confidence in some of those young men. But they're not even anywhere around us nowadays. They preach for the charismatics. Charismatics get bigger offerings, by the way, than Pentecostals do. Okay. Alright. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You can probably walk into any store in this town, including the ones I worked at, and ask them about me. You can do that, but don't bother me at all, because every single person in this town, amen, that I've come in contact with that knows me personally, amen, they love us. Hallelujah. Amen. Because we love them and it's genuine. Amen. The pastor not only has to be a pure man of God with no sin in his life, he also must be able to teach the Word of God. Look at what Paul tells Titus. Titus chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order the things that are wanting and ordained elders in every city, as I had appointed thee, 
If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Sounds easy, don't it? Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 17, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him of whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I would take off my feet and my shoes and let y'all see my feet. Oh, stand Oh, the last of those offices is the teachers. Now, this is one of those offices that overlaps. Now, many of these, these are spiteful ministry, but several of these offices overlap each other. Okay, I know, I know prophets. My dad was a prophet and a teacher. Amen. He was used in both offices. He he would be called to come and teach, and he would teach for sometimes two or three weeks. He was a very deep teacher. He wasn't shallow like me. You know, he didn't. He was deep. And, uh, in fact, he was so deep, I had to get up there with crayons and draw a picture of what he was preaching so people would understand what he was saying. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the truth. All right. So, a pastor, and that's one of the deals of a pastor. He has to be apt to teach or able to teach, you know. So, the pastor and the teacher overlap. Uh, sometimes a pastor and evangelist overlap. Sometimes a pastor... Uh, becomes in, in an evangelistic state. Amen. But that's not my calling. First, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8-11. through 11, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou particular of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. For who, who hath saved us and hath called us and with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Now, you, you understand that's Paul talking. He's an apostle, he's a preacher, and he's a teacher. So the overlapping is there. Amen. So many times you'll see that happen uh, in, in ministry. Paul said of his calling, he was not only that of an apostle, but also a preacher and a teacher. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm closing 24 through 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Don't ever pray for that if you're a young minister. Don't say, God, please make me patient. <laughs> oh, boy. If you do, don't come talking to me about it after all the stuff starts hitting. <laughs> Amen. In meekness, instructing those that oppress themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Amen. So, probably more today than ever before, we need to have the Bible ministry working our lives. I try my best every year in this church to have at least a prophet somewhere during the year. We haven't had in a couple of years, but we're going to have one hopefully this year. I've got one on tap. Amen. I've talked to him. He said he would come, but he couldn't come till next year. So we're just going to try to get him here in 23 or 22, whatever next year is. 22, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Just as those five major tail feathers and an eagle's tail provide direction and keep it flying the way it should go, the fivefold ministry is to keep the church body in line with the Word of God. God's desire is that His church 
would soar into the spirit realm. This is only accomplished through the fivefold ministry, giving the necessary instruction. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand. Amen. Do not forget the announcement tomorrow night. Ladies shell service, 6.45 p.m. Do not be late, ladies, please. Amen. Amen. And then the next night, Wednesday night, please pray at home. One hour, please. We need you to pray. Amen. So let's do that. One hour. I don't care if you stand on your head. You know, if you're, if you're you know, whatever you do, it doesn't matter to me as long as you're praying. Amen. You can, you, but you need, God needs your full attention. Don't wash the dishes and pray. Okay. Hallelujah. Don't say, I'm going to lay right here on the bed and pray. Because you'll get the first five minutes in, and that'll be the end of that story. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, let's just lift our hands and worship the Lord. Thank you, God, for your word tonight. God, your word is truth. God, we're so grateful for the five-fold ministry, God. And I know, Lord, without a doubt, God, uh, Lord, that you're going to use that more this year than you ever have in our, in our services here, God. And we thank you for it. God, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, God. We thank you for providing that five-fold ministry, God, to help us to grow in you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.